Hey, what's up guys, Sir Eminon here, bringing to you a bit of a delayed update to my uh, Dark Lunalite build. Um, so it's very, very long awaited. I know I said I would get this profile out <laughs> quite a while ago, but I've actually been doing a lot of testing in the current format. Lots have changed, YCS Chicago happened, and Dusseldorf at this point. Um, we have kind of a good idea about what the meta is. It still is fledgling in my opinion, but um, now that we kind of sort of know where things stand, especially with the release of Salomon Great. Um, there are a lot of things to consider with this deck, particularly in the side deck, but the ban list also affected us. Obviously we, we uh, lost 3 Greffer, so I had to definitely account for that in the build. Um, it very much kind of caused me to really think about like the core of the build and what I thought was the most foundational and most important. So I actually ended up making this a very trimmed down version. Um, as in, it's actually just 40 cards straight up, um, no 44 or like 48 or 45 or anything. Um, it's a straight up 40 cards, uh, it tries to do the same thing every game. It's actually quite consistent uh, from my testing, and I've been testing quite a lot actually. Um, been going to a lot of uh, events and been playtesting in my a pretty competitive friend group. So yeah, I think this deck has been doing very well, it's still a blind first list but um, just made a lot of adaptations to be able to combat the current format. So yeah, without further ado, let's go ahead and just jump right into the deck list. So I'm not going to go into much detail about like the cards themselves, like what they do. I'm not, I don't really like deck profiling that way. Uh, I like kind of just talking about theory and about like the metagame and just kind of my logic and reasoning for like running the things that I'm running. But like for engine cards, like I don't think any of this really needs to be explained by this point. Um, so obviously, in order to play the game with uh, the combo-oriented Lunalite builds, you need a card that can dump stuff to the grave, uh, which is Kaleido Chick, and a card that can revive stuff, which is Tiger. Um, there's obviously deviations to this, but um, like these are your go-to setup cards, which uh, gets your extender, and then access to your utility stuff, uh, which can also um, act as extenders to a degree, and then obviously Wolf is your game closer. Um, I think these, this ratio is like very much standard. The only thing to maybe consider is a second copy of Emerald Bird, which I do sometimes treat as a starter, but like she's actually kind of a risky play, um, just because she is prone to getting stopped and like it's not that like you want the draw effect as much as you just kind of want to cycle cards to the graveyard. But if you open up like both of these for example, I'd rather just normal summon the Collider Chick every time since Collider Chick is essentially immune to hand traps. But with uh, cards like Droll being on the rise, I just think it's really greedy to try and go for this draw. Especially if we have other cards that you'd rather be searching anyway. Um, if you're tanky into this uh, with the hopes of like trying to cycle a card and you lose to Droll, you're probably just going to lose that game if you don't have any like meaningful extenders, um, which they're very few and far between. You would need like, good or something at that point. But yeah, uh, the other thing actually to consider is a copy of Purple Butterfly. Um, there are hands, especially now in this condensed build where you open up too many Lunalite monsters and you just kind of need a way to unclog. Um, so it can come in handy, it's just a problem that Butterfly itself can also be a bit of a, a cloggy card. So it's like 50-50 and I'm not quite convinced that it's uh, consistent enough to run as far as breaking those bad hands um, due to some of the other cards that I am running to compensate for that. So that's it for the Lunalite cards, uh, for the monsters at least. Um, I think that's pretty self-explanatory uh, and I don't think that that needs to be explained very much at all. Going into the dark portion, uh, we got three Danger Mothman, uh, one Armageddon Knight, the one Greffer, rip, rest in peace, uh, the one Blackwing Zephyr Seely. I'm just gonna slide this up so it's gonna frame a bit more. Uh, we got the one Destrudo, and then we have the two Phantom Knights. Uh, I'm just gonna incorporate these and count them as part of the dark engine. So what changed? Uh, you'll notice a lot less of a danger count, different danger names entirely, and a much cheaper one at that too, so budget players rejoice. But um, this actually is more strategic than it is budget, funnily enough. I think that Nessie also loses pretty hard to draw. Uh, dangers in general lose very hard to draw. So I think that 
Even though Nessie is like a very strong tool, you actually can structure your play to where you make Rusty Bardiche first, which if you have access to getting Zephyrus into the grave, you get curious no matter what because Bardiche gets you a warrior access, this is a winged beast, and you're gonna always have Tiger to counter with this to get a uh, beast warrior. So you will always have access to Curious and you don't actually need as much inherent type diversity. Now the type diversity is still a value which is why we're still playing these cards, but it's not as integral to start off with a Curious play as it was previously, so that's why I thought that the Danger Engine isn't actually as entirely needed to kickstart the combo, just so long as like you're able to extend as much as you can, and the way to alleviate that is just by playing less cards and by playing you know good starters. And I think that Mothman's Graveyard effect actually provides the most utility, being able to not only get the Zephyrus out of the grave if you don't have access to Perfume, but also to just get things into the graveyard like your Serenade Dance. Um, things that can just kind of be stuck in your hand that you want in your graveyard. Um, and at the worst, it's just another level 4 body, you can make 4 tricks with it, you can make other rank 4s, you can still make Curious as a backup. Um, so it has a, has a very, very many cool applications. Um, including in tandem with Greffer. Previously the combo was Greffer plus Nessie is like super combo where you instantly get two types on board and you only need one extender to be able to do the full combo. Um, now that you know we don't have as many Greffers, we went from four copies of Greffer to two, uh, it becomes really hard to kind of rely on it, as well as the fact that again, Nessie and that whole thing kind of just loses to drill very hard. So to be able to accommodate this, I think that it's just better to treat Greffer as another form of like an Armageddon Knight, which can situationally be better if you do have Kaleido Chicken Hand to where like if you get a Veiler or Ash or something, um, you'll have that graveyard set up so you can utilize Tiger to its fullest potential. Um, these are obviously just worse copies of Kaleido Chicks since they are susceptible to hand traps, but in certain ways if you are able to like structure your- if you open well enough to where you have an extender, that mitigates the negativity of the hand trap, then these cards will actually provide more value and um, increasing value in your turns because uh, then your other players would basically just go unhindered and you'd be able to combo off from there. Uh, Zephyrus has been a staple, I don't need to talk about him. The Strudo is a less of a combo starter uh, at one copy uh, and more of a finisher. So instead, of, I cut Imperial Order from this build, at least in the main deck and I moved it to the side, and instead of what instead what I'm doing is I'm making Dawn Dragster and pretty much every board that I can. Um, reason being is that I actually think that Striker is A, dropping in popularity, and B, really the only deck that gets hindered by Imperial Order um, to a large degree. Danger Thunder runs Sekka, so that's not really a big deal. Salomon Grey actually runs surprisingly few spells. It's pretty much the Circle, uh, the one of like Will and uh, Sanctuary, and they run like Foolish Burial and like maybe Monster Reborn, and that's literally it. Maybe Called by the Grave. But their spells are not integral to their overall strategy, and if you put uh, order on their board, they can still very much play through it and outgrind you. So you definitely need other cards that are more impactful in that respect. Uh, there's other decks like the Danger Orcus deck that doesn't care. Like there's so many decks that just don't really care too too much about um, about Imperial Order, uh, Guru Control, for example, also doesn't play too much. Um, like, they care a little bit because they do have a lot of spells, but they can definitely play without it. Um, so yeah, I think that ending on Draxer with this is good uh, as a way to protect yourself from a standby phase Twin Twister on your Azathoth play, or an evilly matched on just your board in general if you do get disrupted. Worst case scenario, if you do happen to draw it and you are in a pinch, then you can use it for a Curious play. Although it does kind of feel bad when that happens since you know you don't get value on it later on in the combo. Which would be the argument for running 3 if you wanted to use it for the purposes of starting the combo rather than ending it. But my purpose is I want it to be the finisher, which is when I'm playing 1. And then finally the Fano Knights. Um, I think that this is pretty staple in any Little Light build. Um, people typically don't run the cloak. I think it's still very good because you want to send it off the Bardashe to search this as an additional extender and to make sure that your Bardashe is always live to be able to send something, so um, just very overall valid reasons to run these cards and I think that they are super super good in the wake of Greffer going to 1 on the Lotus ban list. So that's going to do it for the monsters. Uh, very very 
Good monster count, like, I'm happy with that monster lineup. Moving on to the spells, we have three copies of Tenki, three copies of Perfume, three copies of Foolish Burial Goods, three copies of Call by the Grave, and then the newest edition, which is my one of my favorite editions, is three copies of Twin Twisters. So the rationale behind this is that against other Azathoth decks, you stand by face, twin it away, that basically stops the whole thing. You can play and then you can deal damage from there and out to them if you're going second. If you're going first, you can just go ahead and set it against like Salomon Great or Sky Striker or Altergeist if people are still playing it um, and other control matchups and then just boil them out in the end phase. If you are going second against those control matchups, it helps you uh, navigate the board quite smoothly and actually can help fix your hands with stuff like hard drawn Zephyrses or Phantom Knights or things like that. Um, very good card, very solid. I think that it's one of the best well-rounded cards that is a safe choice to main. The other safe choice to main I think would be Droll and Lockbird. I think it's the best hand trap, at least the most impactful hand trap that's um, relatively wide as far as coverage is concerned. And it is certainly a solid choice to main. I would definitely like Droll and Lockbird and I'm actually citing them. I think they should be somewhere in your list, but um, I'm still kind of testing between Twin and Droll, but tentatively I have Twin just because I think that it's valuable going first and going second and just has a lot of very good utility. So that's it for the three of spells. And then moving on to the one ofs, we have the one copy of Reinforcement of the Army. Um, this is like one of the weakest cards in the deck because it is particularly bad against Thunder Dragon, it's bad against Droll. Um, but just as sort of more consistency, uh, the way the numbers work out, you basically have goods and tanky to act, act as either um, either tiger or Kaleido chick because chick tiger is like pretty much all the combos, right? So good sending perfume is like anything. Tanky is like anything. Uh, you have obviously the three of tiger and three of chick, so that's nine copies of each of those. And then perfume is an additional revival card which uh, eventually gets you the tiger, so that's like considering, like, all things considered, like a 10th, 11th, and 12th copy of tiger in that respect. And then that means that Refer, Armageddon Knight, and Rhoda are the 10th, 11th, and 12th copies of Collider Chick searching for acting and serving as the dumpers. Now, these are strictly worse, like I said before, because they are susceptible to hand traps, but I do think that because you just want to make sure that you open similar hands every game, that it is worth um, it is worth playing them despite their, their downsides. Next up we have the Foolish Burial. Um, nothing much to say. Uh, this plus goods is its own combo, which is super cool. Um, this can act as a, an additional extender. It's super nice in games 2 and 3 if you do side in like your uh, Griffin targets, so you can just freely send the Griffin target and still have this for the Streeter, so you can end on the Dragster plus the Floodgate, which is um, super super nice to have. Uh, and then obviously we have the Phantom Knights Rank of Magic launch. So that is the 18 spells. I don't know if I said it, but it's 20 monsters in the main. And then lastly we have the two trap cards. We have the Phantom Knights of Shade Brigandine as a good extender, and Lunalite Serenade Dance as the other goods target that you want to skip to Graveyard. Uh, creates a trifecta with Perfume and Zephyrus of course, and allows you to just extend, 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 which is pretty much the game plan of this deck. So that's it for the 40 card main deck. We're gonna move on now to the extra deck. So going on to the extra deck here, we have the one copy of Lunalite Leo Dancer and the one copy of Panther Dancer. So I'm between this and a couple other options, which I'll talk about at the end of the video when I talk about like more theory and stuff. Um, I just think that in this format, Leo is actually surprisingly very strong if she manages to um, hit the board. Uh, you never ever want to leave Leo Dancer on the board like at the end of your turn. Um, like as in you don't want to ever summon it if you're not closing out the game that turn because then your opponent is going to out it or um, even worse steal with like a Borlo Dragon or something like that um, or just attack over with like Boral Sword. Uh, two monsters which are still very prevalent so definitely don't leave Leo Dancer out unattended. But if she does end the game then that's Pretty much all you really want to use her for, of course. 
Next up we have the one and only synchro monster, the F.A. Don Dragster. Uh, this is like the final layer of your board. Um, the board being generally as a thought Griffin plus Dragster. It doesn't seem as potent as like Imperial Order with Griffin and maybe a rank 4 as well. Um, this build kind of foregoes the ability to have like the 4 negate or like 4 uh, boss monster or like 4 interrupt board um, in favor of just constantly getting 3 on pretty much I wouldn't say every hand, but like a good 70 to 80 percent of hands um, end on this board. Um, it might even be higher. I, I haven't like run them like complete math on it. It's kind of hard to like account for everything, but um, yeah. In order to like just get the protection for your Azathoth and like for your Griffin and stuff, this is like a really good way to secure that. Next up, we have the Xyz monsters. So we have four strikes as the um, one of the bigger combo starters of the deck. The Time Thief Redoer, which is what you rank up into as a thought. Um, and then we have the one Tornado Dragon. And the one copy of Fire... or er, sorry, Brotherhood of the Fire Fist, Tiger King. So, a thing I want to note about Redoer is that it actually has extremely good utility outside of just being um, ranked up into as a thought. There's plenty of times you can make this going second, uh, after you make Rusty Bardiche. Uh, because Bardashay gets you the Shea Brigandine, and then if you make this, Bardashay gets the pop, and you can use this to non-target Wing Blast a card, which is super valuable. I talked about this um, a bit in my uh, theory video for like the, like when this initially got uh, leaked. Uh, it didn't quite work the way I thought it did in that video because it attaches for effect, but that's actually really good because this allows you to extend. Since it does attach for effect, if you detach an Emerald Bird, you get to special summon a monster from your Banished or your Graveyard. And if you detach a Martin, you get to search for the Serenade Dance as well. So, a lot of very good applications for this card. It does a lot more for this deck than I think like other decks because of the fact that detaching for effect is very good. Uh, this is like kind of the flex rank 4 spot, the Tornado Dragon. I think that um, you could consider like Nightmare, like Evil Swarm Nightmare or uh, Abyss Dweller. Both are very good options this format in my opinion. I just think that because your goal is to summon Azathoth anyway, um, it is kind of a bit redundant if, um, assuming that you have the proper protection um, for the Azathoth play, so I just think that this is overall fine. I think Tiger King, even though Pure Thunder Dragon is not a deck anymore, um, you still need to run this simply because Colossus is still a, big, a bit of a deal. It's not like the biggest problem in the world to overcome, but if you can just set a free search card while negating the card that denies you the search cards, that's just kind of the like cherry on top. There are also some awkward hands where you do get hand trapped and you do need to go into this to be able to set the tanky right away and then um, get Tiger that way. That has actually come up a couple times and you can always convert it into an undercom taker for a Rusty Bartership play. Which is super nice. So as good utility going first and going second, uh, very good in the grind game, super good for just ensuring that your plays go through with its negation effect. Very, very good stuff. And now to the Link Monsters. We have the one Underclock Taker. We have the one copy of Firefighting Darmadol. Uh, we have the Playmakers in Curious Delight Sworn Dominion and the Phantom Knights of Rusty Bardiche. And then we have the Nightmare Package. So one copy of Nightmare Phoenix, one copy of Unicorn, and one copy of Griffin. All right, so I'm gonna briefly talk about these. I think most of these are pretty much the same from my previous list, if not all of them actually. But um, yeah, I think Curious is now more so important than ever because prior to um, like the YCSs, I think not many people really were aware of how potent Bardiche was. Um, but now that it's like kind of gotten its uh, it's a it's time in the limelight, you know, everyone's using their hand traps on this. Uh, people are holding their ash, people are holding their impermanence in Valor, and you need to have a backup plan. And Curious is that backup plan. Um, granted, if you don't have a warrior that um, is like set off this to be able to like make this later, it can be a bit of an issue. But Underclock can actually alleviate that if you weren't required to use it to make the Bardiche in the first place, because it's the Cybers, obviously. So. When you have a Cybers, uh, Winged Beast in the form of Zephyrus, as well as all of your Winolites. Um, or even if you're good enough to draw a Mothman, or if you have like a stray, um, a stray Armageddon Knight, Greffer, or like a hard drawn uh, Shea Brigandine, or Brutes to special with this. Like, there's so many ways that you can still access Curious, even if this gets negated. And the cool thing about Curious is that you can send the Phantom Knight uh, rank up spell, 
and then set it off Griffin so you have Azathoth that way. At the very least, if you think that that's not really relevant enough, you could still just send any extender, you can just make a bunch of rank 4s, and you can do a lot of really cool stuff. Unicorn's one of the cards I would potentially maybe consider cutting. Um, I have about like 3 to 4 other cards I would like to be able to play in the extra deck, but simply just can't do the space. Um, and I think that if not for the fact that uh, you still need just good, easy to make removal that's not very restrictive, um, that's like probably one of the only remaining reasons why Nightmare Unicorn remains still in this extra deck. Um, very very close to being cut, but not quite. Uh, these two are still very good for uh, popping back though. This one especially is a super good. Um, you'd be surprised at how often it's effect to recover banished or um, you know resources in your graveyard is. Uh, it comes up rather frequently, kind of surprisingly enough considering its attack stat. But yeah, um, very very valuable cards to have in the grind game or past turn two. And then finally Griffin, which is an annoying floodgate to deal with. Um, and it just offers you more link zones, so you can keep doing keep doing your plays. Uh, so that's gonna be it for this extra deck. I'm gonna quickly run through the side deck. Uh, I know like this, I kind of rambled on for quite a while there, but I hope you guys are enjoying and appreciating the theory. Let me know if you want me to get like straighter to the point. Um, but here, I, I think I profile a bit differently from most people. Um, a lot of people kind of just like run through the cards or just explain what they do, like they read the card text, but I kind of like to talk about the reasons why I like play the things that I do and like how cards interact with each other and things of that nature. And I like to just kind of like, I really kind of just like to go on a little adventure with the things that I talk about. So yeah, this is going to be my tentative side deck. Uh, of course, very subject to change and you should always base it around your local metagame or regional metagame or anything of that sort. So I'm just going to lay out all the cards here and then just talk about them as I go. So first off, let's start with, by talking about the uh, three Droll and Whopper and an excuse the proxy there. Um, I for some reason don't have a third one, I really should just pick it up. Never got around to doing it. <laughs> Anyways, um, I think it, like I said earlier in the video, it's the best hand trap of the format. Um, it just outright shuts down like the combo decks that utilize dangers, which is like the majority of combo decks. Um, and even stuff like Crusadia Guard Dragon it's good against. Um, it's the only hand trap they think has wide enough coverage that um, puts a severe halt to their turn. Like if they don't have an answer to it, like their board is severely diminished if they can even make a board at all to begin with. So I think Droll is very, very much good to have. Uh, next up are the Kaijus. So this is probably the most interesting theory. Um, so you might be thinking, oh, you just want differently named kaijus and like, you know, Gamma is the lowest one, but there's a little bit more than that. So a lot of the theory stems from the Crusadia Guard Dragon deck from, you know, having access to Waterfront. So what happens if like they put a Gamma Seal with a billion negates? Um, if you put down your own Gamma Seal, it creates a very interesting dynamic where not only can your Gamma Seal force out one of their negates by like responding to one of theirs, but it also kind of like just forces them to like use their negates a bit awkwardly because like if you just have this on board like they will just keep that in mind like they'll uh, like they'll know that oh shoot you know there's a scam seal that can just negate a whole bunch of stuff so definitely definitely very interesting there uh being able to just take away their counters it like deals with the negate and it like takes away like a potential negate that could have happened with you know removing counters so that's like super super cool. Um, similar theory with Dogram. It's uh, basically a regeki if you remove three counters. So it like is a little bit more telegraphed in how it kind of will like interact with the uh, opponent's negations and like the kaiju counters and everything. But it uh, also does offer you know really really cool um, ways to mitigate the gamma that they put on the board. Uh, but the other thing is that. In the event that uh, Salmon Great builds play Gozen Match still, most of them did cut it, but if you are running into a situation where you're running into Gozen Match, um, this deck doesn't have too hard of a time outing it, but um, you are able to just go ahead and use Dogron if you want to. Um, if you wanted to uh, get rid of like their Link Monster so that you don't have to worry about like Roar or anything, or like Rage, um, it also is obviously good against Striker, like Kaijus in general. 
Uh, Radiant is the worst one in terms of its effect. It is effectively just play or summons a token, which isn't the best or most valuable effect since we don't have any problem generating Link Fodder, but it is nice as far as synergizing with Greffer, and in the cases of like the Crusadia boards that, that have the waterfront, it is at least removing counters, so um, there's that. We have the three Pankratops, which is good in terms of not only killing the rank up magic spell, but also just like having very good board presence against stuff like Salmon Great. It forces them to use a lot of their protective defensive resources in ways that they might not want to. Um, it's good against like, you know, traditional control matchups like Striker, Alter Guys, of course. Um, it's just an all around very well rounded card right now, and I think that it's pretty much in everyone's side deck to be honest, if not in their main deck. Um, if I did want to make like a blind second list with like uh, Phantasmay to help draw into like their second cards, then you know, that's what I would do. But I don't have Phantasmay, so I'm not gonna do that. Do that. Um, and I actually think that this like combo variant is like kind of just less inherently risky because going second is still kind of risky in my opinion because of the combo decks running around. Uh, we have the three red reboot, which is basically just for trap decks, of course. Uh, which are seeing less and less play, which is a little bit unfortunate because this card is so free when it does resolve, but you do still want to respect those matchups in the event that you do run into them, especially at like local or regional levels, um, things can come up. And then we have the most interesting portion of the side deck right here. So uh, I'm going to start, start off with the Imperial Order actually. Um, it was moved from the main to the side deck, and you guys already know what the purpose of it is for. It's for uh, Curious into Griffin, um, very very good stuff. And then Silent Graveyard. So I'm very, very much a fan of this card actually at the moment. It beats Dangers, it beats um, the like Orgus decks, it just beats uh, combo decks in general. Like if you happen to run into the Mirror Match, uh, good luck activating Martin and Grave or Zephyros or Perfume or Serenade Dance, like any of those cards. They can't activate. Um, well, they can't activate, they're just negated. <laughs> um, yeah, so like the difference between this or like uh, Different Dimension Ground, which is something else I considered, is that uh, if you flip Different Dimension Ground, they can still activate Dangers from the hand and then activate their uh, effects because they just have to be discarded. They don't have to be discarded to the, discarded to the graveyard. So if you flip dim or Different Dimension Ground, then they'll be able to like at least still make a board. Like here, this doesn't stop them from activating Dangers, but it pretty much like hinders the viability of what they can, the boards that they can produce if you, you know, hit certain cards out of their hand, you know, as well as just, you know, the things that you want to stop from hitting the grave anyway, like the, you know, baby dragons if, you know, they hit the grave, or things like, uh, thunder dragons too, I think it's those. Uh, so just really good stuff, uh, as another curious griffin target going first. And then finally, we have evil swarm nightmare. Um, it's really, really close between this and Abyss Dweller. Both are extremely good choices, um, and I really would like to main one, one of them so I can just side the other and you know, be on my way, but Escher deck space is extremely tight. But this is really good as a hedge against Salmon Grape. Uh, it's really good to just book uh, the monsters that they summon, particularly Gazelle and like Spinny and stuff. It's nice to have utility as a Dark Rank, rank 4 Xyz monster uh, to trigger Bardiche if you need to. Um, that comes up in like fringe scenarios. It's good against rogue decks like Crusadia Guard Dragon. You can just flip whatever they summon to Magius' zone and like they have a hard time playing. And if they do have an extender, you have a second book. Uh, same deal with like Pendulum and stuff. Um, so yeah, I really just am a fan of this card. I think that it got a lot better as combo decks kind of just progressed into you know more reliant on like their main deck sort of like Kickstarters. Um, it is less good against Danger Thunder, but you still are able to like interrupt a couple of the plays. You just, you just have to be a little bit more conservative with its use. But yeah, that's going to be it for the extra deck. And then I'm going to quickly just talk about some other cards that I have been considering, or things that like you might be wondering about that are absent from the Haha, just kidding, I don't know when to stop talking because this was already a 30 minute video and I'm not going to make you guys sit through another 10 minutes worth of content. That'll be in a different video, don't worry. But um, if you did manage to make it this far into the video, which I hope people do enjoy this sort of content, leave a hashtag penguins are great in the comment section down below. I would be very happy. Um, but yeah, thank you guys so much for watching this video. I really do appreciate it. Hope you guys enjoyed. Let me know what you guys think in the comment section down below, and I'll catch you in the next one.
See you guys.